to Leo Frank, the story of Leo Frank. And if you haven't heard the story of Leo Frank, um, I encourage you to look it up and read for yourself and see what you think of it. What's up, everybody? It's Chicago Talk Show host. And in case you haven't noticed, hashtag ban the ADL has been trending on X. And so I thought I'd make a video on discussing who Leo Frank was, which was the catalyst for the creation of the Anti-Defamation League. And so I used this source, What Went Wrong, The Creation and Collapse of the Black Jewish Alliance, written by Murray Friedman, to discuss this piece of history from the lens of the author, who is Jewish, and what he thought of the Leo Frank trial. As always, I encourage you to make your own decisions and come up with your own conclusions. I encourage you to also watch the full video related to this topic and let me know what you think. And so we'll get started. <clears throat> so Murray Friedman, he writes, a defining moment in the partnership between blacks and Jews occurred with the Leo Frank case, an episode whose painful ambivalence symbolizes the complexity of this alliance from its outset to the present day. Listen to how he writes this. A Jew convicted by a black man's testimony set blacks and Jews against each other. Yet paradoxically, the lynching of Leo Frank caused the two groups to identify more closely with one another. Saturday, April 26, 1913. Confederate Memorial Day was a holiday throughout the South, but Leo Frank, a Jew, that's, that's my uh, clarification, manager of the National Pencil Company's plant in Atlanta had gone to work anyway. The factory was closed and safe for an office boy and janitor. Frank was alone when an employee named Mary Fagan, a white Southern girl of humble parentage, came in to pick up her wages. She was just 13 years old. Young for a factory worker even then, but she would get no older. At three o'clock the next morning, her bludgeoned body was found face down on a slag heap in the plant's basement. The author writes, one day later, Atlanta police arrested Leo Frank for the murder of F Mary Fagan. His accuser was the janitor James Conley, who said Frank had ordered him to conceal the girl's body in the basement after admitting he had killed her when she resisted his advances. Interesting stuff. As always, you make your own, you make your own uh, decisions. But the story thickens. The author writes, Frank denied the charges. It was his word against Conley's, the word of a white sup supervisor against a poor black laborer who had previously served time in prison for petty thievery. In the South of 1913, there was no precedent for a conviction under such circumstances, but, but Leo Frank was not a white Southerner. He was a Brooklyn Jew, a Northern t transplant who had married into a prominent Jewish family in, in Atlanta and president of the city's Benai and Bereth Lodge. Trigger warning, things are going to get spicy as I quote this. So uh, Murray writes, The trial was a mob scene as angry cries of, quote, death to the Jew, end quote, from white militants outside the courthouse reverberated within earshot of the judge and jury. In this explosive atmosphere, Leo Frank's lawyers responded to the intemperate outburst of Georgia's powerful populist leader, Tom Watson, parentheses, who in his weekly Jeffersonian magazine repeatedly demanded the execution of the, quote, filthy, perverted Jew of New York, end quote, parentheses, end parentheses, with attacks of their own on the key prosecution witness. Quote, who is, this who is this man, James Conley, end quote. Black, drunken, lying, end quote. Frank also wondered how the, quote, testimony of Southern white women of an impeachable character, quote, end quote, who spoke on his behalf could be disbelieved while the, quote, perjured vaporings of a black brute alone brackets could be, and brackets accepted as the whole truth, end quote. 
The author goes on, listen to this. On August 23, 1913, Leo Frank was convicted of killing Ma Mary Fagan. In the trial's aftermath, Watson, exploiting local distrust, distrust and dislike of both Jews and capitalists, continued to denounce Leo Frank as a member of the, quote, Jewish aristocracy, end quote. And he accused, quote, rich Jews, end quote, of determining that, quote, no aristocrat of their race should die for the death of a working class Gentile, end quote. Worried about the hysteria being generated, the nation's Jewish community mobilized behind the condemned man, hoping to upset the verdict on appeal. By his own account, Albert Lasker, the noted advertising executive, spent a hundred a hundred thousand dollars in personal funds and took a year from his agency to rally support for Frank. Just think about that for a second. Uh, one hundred thousand dollars for in 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 nineteen thirteen money. So that's that's real money, right? None of this stuff where we just print money and whatever. Um, real money, all for that racehorse of Leo Frank. That's something. We're going to keep going on in the Leo Frank story. Murray writes, As Frank's attorney in the appeal effort, Louis Marshall, president of the American Jewish community, attacked James Conley's credibility, James Conley again being the black janitor, and argued that rabble-rousing prosecution tactics in Atlanta had deprived his client of a fair trial. Marshall brought the case to the attention of Adolph Oakes, publisher of the New York Times, which editorialized in favor of Frank and labeled Conley a, quote, black monster, end quote. Without naming the janitor, the Washington Post went even further, declaring that the brutal, that the brutal murder appeared to be, quote, characteristic of a drunken, ignorant Negro, end quote. The Post was convinced that, quote, no intelligent white man would do such a thing. End quote. Whew. Spicy. But we're going to keep going. Murray writes, The Frank episode initially threatened the fledgling partnership between blacks and Jews. The New York Age was critical of Frank supporters who sought to place the blame for Mary Fagan's murder on the black handyman. The black-owned Chicago Defender, in a manner reminiscent of the Amsterdam News headline, quote, Many blacks no Jews arrested in Crown Heights, end quote, of almost 80 years later declared, quote, Jews raise millions to free Frank and put blame on innocent man, end quote. In the two years following the Frank trial, Marshall carried his appeals all the way to the Supreme Court. The author continues, with Justices Oliver Wendell Holmes and Charles Evans Hughes dissenting, the court denied a writ of, er of error requested by Frank's lawyers, and his execution was subsequently scheduled for June 1915. Final appeals were made to Georgia's governor, John Slayton. Tom Watson, exercising his political muscle, pressured the governor to let the hanging proceed. Yet at the last minute, in an act of courage that would destroy his career, Slayton commuted the sentence to life imprisonment. Frank's victory was short-lived, however. Two months later, he was taken by angry whites. From the prison where he was being held, carried to a field some miles away, and hanged. When I read this passage, the, the, the inherent racism from the author when it comes to black is thinly veiled. When I read the sentence, quote, a Jew convicted by a black man's testimony, end quote, to say that that's inflammatory with overall with racism is an understatement. This is somebody who clearly thinks that they're way better than another person, another man, and it's just unrestrained pride in their identity. Okay, so the author has painted one heck of a picture about the whole Leo Frank trial, which was admirably written. Um... But the author doesn't shy away from making his own conclusions about the actual trial. The author has determined, as he writes, Leo Frank did not kill Mary Fagan. His innocence was finally established in 1982 when Alonzo Mann, who had been Frank's office boy, 
admitted after 69 years of silence that he had seen Conley with the body of Mary Fagan in his arms on that day in April 1913. Mance, who was 83 when he finally cleared his conscience, said the janitor had threatened him with death, and so he had said nothing. With Mann's belated admission, the state of Georgia pardoned Leo Frank, and the case was declared closed. So we have this story of this dead 13-year-old white girl who was advanced upon, the story goes, by the Jewish owner of the business. The Jewish owner, of course, blames someone else who was a black janitor. Okay. And now later in the, now this happened around in 1913, flash forward to the 80s, and all of a sudden there's this clear up in history, right? A sort of rewriting of the history, exonerating Leo Frank from this murder charge. But who really knows? I mean, who really knows what happened? Um, but the fun part is, that's for you to decide.